The old song, I don't think that probably the person who wrote it thought it would sound quite like that, do you? <laughs> I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, still I'll follow. Though none go with me, still I'll follow. Though none go with me, still I'll follow. No turning back. No turning back. World behind me, cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. No turning back. You know, that is an incredibly simple song. And yet its truth is dead on the money. That's what a life in the Lord is all about. A life in the Lord and any growth that we will have in that life really rests on one thing and one thing only. It's a decision. Huge decision. But then that decision is followed by a million smaller decisions that echo that same decision over and over and over and over maybe dozens of times in the same day. Now we are studying currently um, Jesus' seminar on growth, spiritual growth. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, open your Bible to Matthew 5. Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5 and 6 and 7. We're still in 5. And uh, today we want to look at a section that hits every one of us right where we are. Uh, where we live, every one of us, every day. We need to, to listen to what the Lord says here because it's so important to us. Now, I want to start by uh, going back, in a sense, to what Pastor Daniel ended with last week. A tremendous statement. And, uh, but the, the last part of the scripture that he talked about becomes the springboard for what we want to consider today because it has everything to do with the directive that Jesus himself gives. So let's go back to the 17th verse there of Matthew 5. And Jesus says, don't think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. Assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law until it's all fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Wow. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. All right, first thing you want to see here is the directive because the directive sets the pace for everything else. And what is the directive? Live in such a way that you glorify God with your life in everything. Simple, really. Live in such a way that you glorify God in everything. Now, that's what his words all boil down to and it's not hard to understand. But to get it in the way that the people who heard it then got it, you really have to go back and understand the whole context of it because when they heard law or what we think of the rules, the regulations, when they heard that, it meant something very different to them than it means to us. Yeah, we have some understanding of rules and regulations and law and the Bible and all that, but not even vaguely like those people understood. See. To them, the law didn't just mean the Old Testament, or for us, the whole Bible, but for them, the Old Testament. It didn't just mean that. It meant that, to be sure, but it meant a whole lot more than that. It meant all of the rules and all the regulations that had evolved across the centuries. You know, the... the the law, as it were, essentially was given by God in a relatively simple way. But over the years, they came to be added onto with all kinds of 
rules, all sorts of regulations that got more and more and more and more difficult for people to deal with. In the beginning, in a sense, you could say that they were principles. Yes, there were certainly rules and regulations as you go to, through the Old Testament, but at heart, it has to do with principles. But those principles got pressed into all kinds of exceedingly difficult regulations, difficult for people to be able to actually live out in their lives. For instance, look at Exodus 20. Keep your place here, but also go back and look at Exodus 20. Really basic. And what you're going to see is this thing grows like Spanish rice in a high school classroom or uh, cafeteria. Just blah, 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 blah. Is there more on my plate? Uh, Exodus 20, verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, God says. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of your Lord God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. All right, great principle, right? One day a week, set it aside to enjoy the Lord and his creation. How hard can this be? To enjoy the Lord and everything he created. Think about Shabbat, Sabbath in the beginning. What happened? God created the heavens and the earth in the six days. And what happened on the seventh day? Ah, I like that sort of sat back and surveyed the whole thing, sort of like I do every morning as I sit at my table there where I eat breakfast and I look out at all the birds and get my BB gun to shoot the squirrel. And I mean, just, you know, the <laughs> I always miss him. Come on, it's a, I got the thing when I was nine years old. What do you think this spring does? <laughs> but I at least feel better about it. <laughs> he, he hears it, and so he takes off. Just enjoying God's creation. <laughs> it's a great principle. But I want you to look back at the practice, what the practice became. You know, for instance, look, look at the statement in Exodus 20, and you have to say to yourself, okay, but, but what is keeping it holy? What does that look like? Or what actually constitutes work? Well, I'll tell you how that devolved. Work, what does that mean? Well, it, it meant, for instance, that you couldn't carry a burden on the Sabbath. What was a burden? Well, a burden was anything that was equal to the weight of one dried fig. Seven-eighths of a fig, that much you could lift. A full fig, mm, I don't think so. That's just a little bit too heavy. Uh, it was the equivalent to one full gulp of milk that would be a burden. Anything less than that, not so much a burden. A, a honey enough to, to cover a wound, that would be a burden. And you weren't allowed to carry such a thing. Um, you couldn't carry enough ink to write two letters of the alphabet. One letter, that would be okay. And you couldn't write two letters of the alphabet with either hand. Only one letter, because to do more than that would be to do work. Uh, if you put a bandage on a wound, you could put a bandage on a wound as long as there was no ointment on the bandage, because that would be work. That would be healing. If you had an ear infection, you could put some cotton or something in your ear, but couldn't have any medication on it, because that would be healing. You see, you could do something that would stop sort of disintegration, but you couldn't do anything that would add to health because they determined that anything like that would be work. I mean, things had just gotten absurd so that God's word wasn't enough. So that over the centuries, the rabbis, as they talked about this stuff, argued about this stuff, continued to refine and define so that finally they had to write a book about all the rules that they saw came from the book. And that book was called the Mishnah. 
But of course, that wasn't enough. And so then they had to write commentaries on the Mishnah, which was rules that came from the book, the original book, right? And the, that was the Talmud. And the Talmud, the one that they developed when they were in captivity in Babylon, for instance, was 60 volumes long. I mean, are you catching the drift here? As to the weight of the law that these people were supposed to follow, and you were supposed to somehow keep track of all this stuff? Anybody have a problem filling out your income tax? You're talking about a little form here, come on. Now we're talking about 60 volume commentaries on another volume, commentaries on another volume, and they're supposed to keep track of this, and the Pharisees themselves couldn't do it. In fact, at one point, Jesus pointed that out. It was ridiculous, and what Jesus is saying here at the heart of this is, guys, you've completely missed the point. What's the point? Just live in such a way that you glorify God with your life. That's it. In everything you say, everything you do, everything you are. See, in, in the word, God gives us a track to run on, the parameters within which to live. Yeah, no question, there are some specifics in there. But those specifics are no more burdensome than for Adam and Eve in the garden, all designed for us to, to be blessed, to be enhanced, to grow. Remember in the garden, God said, hey, it's all yours. Have at her, enjoy. By the way, watch out for that one tree. Don't eat of that thing, man, it's gonna kill you. It's gonna suck the very life out of you. Don't go there, but here, it's all yours. It's really enjoy. That's, that's what we find in the word. That, that's the law. He gives us the parameters within which we will find blessing. And we can choose to go outside of that and we're not gonna find the blessing that we desire. But the directive here is really clear. Just live in such a way that you bring glory to God. You know, it's interesting. Jesus, in his very life, and he's really talking about here, was the fulfillment of the law. He fulfilled everything in his life. So if you want to understand how life is to be lived, just look at him. There it is. Just Live like him. I've decided to follow Jesus. No looking back. No turning back. Just live like him. But you know what? Though that is the directive, we have a dilemma. And that is, it's not all that easy to do. Especially when you understand what it means in its totality. Listen to how he plays this out, beginning in the 21st verse. Jesus says, you've heard it said, to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there until you've paid the last penny. You've heard it said, to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you. It's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, cast it from you. It's no more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Furthermore, it's been said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, 
but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. I say to you, don't swear at all, neither by heaven, for it's God's throne, nor by earth, for it's his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you can't make one hair white or black. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Wow. That's the dilemma we face, really. The, the directive to live in such a way that you glorify God and everything, the dilemma, how do I do that? Because we all know what we all know, and that is everything, it seems, in our being strains to go the other direction. Everything that we seem to hassle with, handle in life, seems to push us in a completely different way. And you know how you feel about those things. I know how I feel about those things. So how can I ever hope to live like Jesus? You tell me, does this seem possible? Go back to this 20 first verse through the 26 the Pharisees here note that it's wrong to murder well Jesus just ratchets it up a few notches and he says it's wrong even to be angry with somebody without just cause even to say raka to somebody now I I honestly have not said that recently to anybody you may have and you know just in one of those moments you couldn't help yourself raka it was just out there before you could take it back but but here's the deal, what it means is, is idiot, blockhead, numbskull. Probably you've never said that about anybody, right? Like that guy just cut you off on a freeway, or that person who got in front of you in the line at Safeway, or, 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 you understand what I'm saying here? You know how difficult it is not to go there and get totally torqued, so that blah, 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 you sort of Go for it with your mouth and in your heart. Well, what's the Lord saying? If you any even go there, you're, you're in trouble. Or he goes on. Pharisees note that it's wrong to commit adultery. Jesus says, mm, wrong. It's even worse just to look on some hot gal or guy and say, whoa, nice, and go where your thoughts take you. Because when you go there, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Wow. Really? Ever gone there in your mind? I mean, years ago, some of you will even remember a president of the United States who admitted that at times he had had lust in his heart for some, oh, no one else on the planet had. Couldn't relate to that said they as they lusted after who knows who. You know, the truth is it's always a problem. Or if you go to verses 31 and 32, the Pharisees note that if a person divorced, he needed to make it legal. Now this just shows you how things had deteriorated across the centuries. That isn't what God ever put together to begin with. As a matter of fact, when Moses allowed for a divorce, Jesus said it was because not that that's what God desired, but that it was because of the hardness of people's hearts. And so Jesus then takes it, whoa, way up several notches and says, if you divorce, the, in that case, let me, let me explain something else. In that setting, divorce was so commonplace that guys just got rid of their wives constantly. Notice it wasn't the other way around. And guys just, they, they didn't like the way they made breakfast or whatever, and they just said, get out of here, and they hooked up with somebody else. Didn't even bother to go through the process of getting a legal divorce. And so it made that woman illegal. It made her immoral as she was just sort of out there in the world. So they were saying, the Pharisees said, don't do that. Jesus said, no, if you divorce your wife for anything other than sexual immorality, then you're gonna cause her to commit adultery and you yourself, if you remarry, are gonna commit adultery. Now I know as I scan the room here right now that there are more than a few people who have been through this process and so I know that you understand up close and personal how 
difficult this is. I can say straight up, this presents us with a very real problem. Amen? Amen. Keep going. The Pharisees note that it's bad for a person to swear falsely, that is, take an oath and then not follow through. Jesus says, no, you shouldn't have to do that at all. As a matter of fact, in everything, your yes needs to be a yes, your no, a no. You stand by your word, period. Even if it hurts you, to keep your word doesn't make any difference. You gave your word, your word is your bond, that's the end of it. Ever have a problem with that? I would suggest to you that's a reason why we have contracts, because we have huge problems with that. And a reason why we have lawsuits over contracts because we have a massive problem with that, right? And so when you really think about this stuff, you think, good grief, if I am supposed to honestly live for the Lord, how can I do that when it comes down to the nitty gritty of the way that I live my life every day, this isn't easy. In fact, it seems to be impossible. You know, we know our own struggles. We know our own weaknesses. We know our own failures. We certainly know we aren't a 10 across the board. And he's essentially saying, at least we're a, unless we're a 10 across the board, we are in trouble, big trouble. This is what caused centuries ago people to become monks and flee to the mountains to the wilderness, to caves, to monasteries, because they wanted to be pure, they wanted to be holy. And so they figured the only way they could do that was to separate themselves from life as it's normally lived, because as long as they were involved in life as it was normally lived, they would end up doing all these things. The problem is, you can't run far enough, because you always end up with you. You know what I'm saying? And there you've got this fertile imagination and all kinds of things are going on your head even though there's nobody around you. So what in the world are you supposed to be able to do? We may, may know the directive that we are to live in such a way that we glorify God, but we have this dilemma. How do we do it? Well, it has everything to do with the decision. It really does come down to a decision, the decision. Will we follow Jesus or won't we? Does he have, as he says he has, the words of life or doesn't he? Is he the way, the truth, and the life or isn't he? Does he have the best way of approaching life and finding joy and peace and security and stability no matter what's going on or doesn't he? Is his way better than our way or is our way better than his? What is the decision you're gonna make? You're gonna follow Jesus or not? As far as I'm concerned, this whole thing boils down to two things. Let's make it really simple. First of all, you have to make the decision to follow Jesus. Everything flows from that. The decision where you draw a line in the sand. You know, a year or so ago, I made a decision that I was going to lose weight. And it had to be, for me, a radical decision. No turning back. No turning back. That decision had to be so set in concrete that every little decision that would face me then would always cave to the decision. Am I gonna have that Tim's Cascade or not? Love those things. Am I gonna have those French fries? Am I gonna have... And so if I lost 10 pounds or 15 pounds, would I go out and reward myself with a big meal at some fancy restaurant, which many are want to do? Absolutely not, because that would tube my whole decision. If food was going to be a reward, what in the world? I, was, I would just be playing a game, right? So I had to see what I ate in a completely different light. 
and it had everything to do with the decision. Why in the world do you think I have this crazy thing here that tells me every step I take and calorie I expend every hour of every day? Why do I have two different programs on my cell phone where I record every last bite that goes into my mouth every day and my weight to the tenth of a pound every morning? Why is that? Because I know the decision that I made about that. I know that. And no turning back. No turning back. That's where you got to be with Jesus. So much more so. I mean, wait, come and go. We're all going to look great in heaven anyway. Give me a break. It's just that some are going to get there a whole lot quicker than others. And uh, is that the way you want to get there? You know, you've got to make the decision to go after Jesus. You can't say, I've decided to follow Jesus and then just go off this way and that way in every direction because you don't make the little decisions that are flowing from the big decision. You understand what I'm saying with this? It all starts with the decision. And then, consciously, you need to do three things. You need to depend upon God's provision. His provision of grace, his provision of freedom, his provision of new life. See, Jesus accomplished for us what we could never accomplish for ourselves. (laughs) Guys, he died for our sin. He paid the price, took on our shame, our guilt, upon himself by his stripes we have been made free we have been set free no we can't hope to be able to do every last thing possibly right he's already done it all in him everything is yes and amen that's why we want to tuck into him we want to draft off him We want to take hold of his provision. We want to live in his grace every day. Wow. We want to enjoy his freedom every moment. Yes, I don't have to be bound up by all this stuff that's trashing my life. We want to live in the newness of life every day that he has given to us. And we depend upon that. God's provision then you want to default to God's power and not to your own. You and I don't have the strength to live that new life. But guess what? He has given us his strength to be able to pull off his life. You know, so many times we make the decision to follow Jesus and then we try like crazy to do it in our own steam and it won't work. That's why Jesus talked about more times than I can even begin to remember the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm leaving, but I'm going to give you another encourager, another comforter, one who is going to inspire you, one who is going to direct you, one who is going to reveal truth to you, one who is going to give you courage, one who is going to give you the ability to to do the things that you would never be able to do in your own strength. But if that's going to happen, you got to yield to him. You know, his strength kicks in when ours kicks out. And he gives us that. But we've got to yield to the Holy Spirit of God. We've got to realize that he is not just some kind of mystical power out there. He is God in us in a whole other way, new way, fresh way to enable us to live the brand new life. You know, we we default to God's power and not to our own. You are never going to be able to live Jesus' life on your own strength. And then finally, you determine to follow God's path. You determine to go where he wants to take you, to live like he wants you to live. Let's, Let's just circle back here to these. Go back to verse 21. Let's let's go back to what he says and and think about what this looks like in real time. What do you do when you're angry with somebody? You resolve it. That's what you do. Like Paul says, you don't let the sun set on your anger. You don't let it fester. The enemy loves that. 
he loves to just have all that turmoil and tension and stress going on. He loves to have people mad at other people. What television is filled with today, angry people. What our culture is filled with today, angry people. People shouting other people down and doing everything they can to make life miserable for other people. That's not Jesus' way. Jesus' way is, he said, look, if you've got a problem with somebody, work it out quickly. Don't let this thing go on between just the two of you. Leave it there. Be done with it and move on. Sounds good, doesn't it? Jesus style. What, what, what do you do when you're feeling tempted physically? Well, you get rid of the triggers, the things that move you to go in the wrong direction. You know, so that may mean that in your life you need to get rid of cable or satellite television if you always migrate to shows that aren't going to be good for your mind and where they're going to take you. Maybe it means that the only movies you watch from now on out are cartoons. Maybe it means because you know yourself and how you function that you really can't open that laptop when you're on the road in the motel at night because you know the sites that you're going to end up on and you know what that's going to do to you. Maybe it means that you don't go to the beach like you used to go to the beach because there are things that go on there that are just going to be a distraction. See, what he's saying here is that anything that distracts you from glorifying God and everything, just get rid of it. Get it out of the way. That's all. Just get it out of the way. That's why he talks about if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, or your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Obviously, he's not literally talking about ripping your eyes out and cutting your hands off. Otherwise, you only have four choice or four times. What do you do in the fifth? Take out your brain. You know, you can still think, even if you can't you got no hands and eyes anymore. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying just get rid of the distractions. You got this stuff that tempts you? Get rid of the distractions. And don't find yourself even going close to the edge. What do you do when you want out of your marriage? Well, you look more to God and his possibilities than to yourselves and your problems. It takes two to tango in every situation. You know, I read a statistic. I think I may have said something about it here not long ago, but I read a statistic recently that the highest divorce rate right now is among people who are over 50. Is that not interesting? Whereas the divorce rate in our society in some ways is starting to go down a bit, in that group it's going up. And the bulk of those divorces are triggered by the female in, and in at least 75% of those cases it has nothing to do with infidelity. Just want to do something new. I guess been watching Sex in the City or who knows what. There's got to be more for me out there. Now, I understand that there can be exceptional problems and all the rest, but that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is that God intended for a man and a woman to be together and to grow together. You pick your mate, you pick your problems. Punky. And, you know, wife number two, husband number two, you got a whole other set of problems, but there's still problems. And number three, four, five, and six, same deal. Maybe the biggest problem is you through all that. And so, you know, you look to the Lord. You believe God for better. What do you do when you feel like going back on your word? You choose to keep your word to others just like you depend upon God to keep his word to you. And we all do. We all depend upon God to be faithful to us, right? We all depend upon God to care for us like he said he would. We depend upon God to love us as he said he does. We depend upon the Lord and we depend upon his word, his truth. And so as we follow after Jesus, that means that our word can be depended upon as well. You know, it's funny, it's a strange thing. When you follow after Jesus, the more you do that, the more your life looks like his. Isn't that amazing? And the more your life looks like his, the more you find yourself fulfilling all of those principles that God has because it's all to be found in him and in his life. 
Go back to that song that we sang. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. You want more of Jesus and more of his life? It's a decision. Follow him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, <laughs> oh, we just have to confess that we make things so exceptionally difficult. when with you they aren't that way at all. Thank you for explaining it to us. Helping us to understand that life is to be found in you and it really is as simple or as complex as making that one big decision to follow you. Lord, my sense is that there are more than a few here today for whom that was really more of a little decision than a big decision. They sort of decided to follow you. But they really didn't draw that line in the sand. They really didn't make that decision and then set their lives in motion in such a way that they wouldn't step back across that line. And I know that you want to speak to their hearts today. The point isn't what they did or didn't do yesterday. The point is what they do from this point forward. That they have the opportunity to follow you with reckless abandon and joy, being contagious in their love for you and their lives in you, affecting dramatically the lives of people all around them with that love and grace and freedom and joy that comes from you every day, fresh every morning, through the good times and the bad times and everything, Lord. You just bring to us life and you infuse it in us. Thank you. And thank you for bringing them here today that truly they could get a breath of fresh air and realize, okay, whatever has been, has been, but now we're moving into a whole new venture in life with Jesus and I'm going after it. Lord, I know that you want your people to grow and I know you want your people to go with you and in no other way and with no other one. Lord, thank you. Thank you for those you have brought to this place today who don't know Jesus, who have never put their lives in him. Thank you for the fact that in this place today, as they make a decision to follow Jesus, that he will meet them, he will embrace them, he will give them the pardon they need for their sin as they confess their sin. He'll set them free. Lord, they'll have an opportunity to just start a new life here today. As we remain in prayer right now, if you are one who desires to start that new life today, to follow Jesus, to say, okay, I'm in. As we remain in prayer, would you just raise up your hand right now? If that's you, you want that life, and you're going to go after it. God bless you. I see that was quick. Good for you. God bless you. Raise up your hand that I can see you, please, and be in prayer with you. God bless you. Gotcha. Gotcha. Others. Lord, thanks for those in this place today who are indicating that they desire to go after you. As they're willing to confess you before men, your promise is that you will confess them before the Father in heaven, and we believe that. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your life. Thank you for the joy that we can have in living for you. We just look forward to what you're going to roll out in this day now. In Jesus' name. Amen.